<laughs> well, this is exciting, isn't it? So I'm Kevin Hartman. I'm Interim Dean of the Peck School of the Arts here at UW-Milwaukee. I'm very happy to welcome you here today for the special conversation between our very own Chancellor Mark Money and UWM alumnus Willem Dafoe. There he is. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Hartman, and good afternoon. Are we excited? <laughs> All right. I have to tell you, thank you for coming. And uh, thank you to the Peck School of the Arts, Dean Kevin Hartman, all the people behind the scenes that have made today happen. This has been, uh, I believe, Mr. Defoe, Willem, if I may. Yes, uh, of course. This, this, has been, <laughs> this has been, I believe, four to five years in the making. Um, I, I had the joy of calling Mr. Defoe some years back and uh, announcing that he's going to be honored with an honorary degree, which we are so thrilled about given his significant remarkable accomplishments in film and theater and really humanitarian efforts, a number of different things that are just holding all of us in awe, so very well deserved. But because his schedule is so busy, typically filming three or four films at different locations around the world and based in Rome, which he flew in from last night. Um, let's hear it again for Mr. Defoe. Willem. So, Willem, we've, we've had some conversation about today. Yes. We're going to have, um, I think, three or four questions. We'll, we'll warm up. I'll, I'll ask you some questions. Okay. And then we'll get the students engaged. Does that sound all right? Sounds good. Yeah. 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 So we'll, we'll engage the students. So what we'll do then is we'll um, have a microphone. Uh, make sure you're ready to go. Raise your hand if you want to ask a question. And then I'll throw a question in. And we'll just go back and forth and have some fun. Does that sound all right? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. So... We're particularly pleased because we do have student-centric audience. Most of the folks here are, are uh, from across our campus, but especially in the Peck School. Let's start with your time at UWM. You came here from Appleton in the early 1970s. Uh, we've spent a little time. You've driven around Milwaukee a little bit. You've been on campus. Tell me about some of your memories. What, what do you recall, and, and, and uh, what were some of the highlights of your time here? <laughs> you know, the truth is, as I go around, and it's fun to be back, and it's fun to see the buildings that I recognize and things that have changed and try to uh, I remember people and places and events. That's, there's a pleasure in that. But the truth is, I didn't know Milwaukee, bless you. Thank you. I didn't know Milwaukee as, as well as I would have liked to because the nature of being in the theater department was very production oriented. So I found myself and I was also working a lot of the time that I was a student. So I didn't have a lot of free time, so I wasn't hanging out. And when I was hanging out, I was hanging out at the theater. I, I remember, um, you know, I used to sleep a lot in the uh, lounge upstairs of the theater building because it was more convenient than going home because we'd work long hours and I could sleep a little bit. And I sort of enjoyed waking up that like you know, five o'clock in the morning, and usually you had a deal with a security guard that he wouldn't hassle you because you weren't supposed to sleep there. But <laughs> he'd let me do it, and I'd wake up at about five and start uh, studying a little bit, and maybe go back to sleep. <laughs> 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 These are the things that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then after I finished uh, the time I spent at uh, UWM in the theater department, for a little while, I worked with a small company, a theater company in, New, uh, in uh, Milwaukee called Theater X, which used to be, uh, which until just recently still existed um, as an entity. Uh, so I was with them for a couple of years, and those, those are the memories uh, that I have. Um, so it was mostly pretty much based around theater productions. Uh, I was hanging out, you know, as people do with the people that you're working with. Um, I do remember Downer Avenue. I do remember the Tuxedo Bar. I remember 
seeing movies at the Downer, which showed really good art films in the day, um, which kind of opened my eyes to uh, a different kind of cinema than I knew before. So yeah, a flood of memories. And uh, I just arrived last night. I'm a little jet lagged, but uh, I hope in the next day uh, to wander around a little bit and cultivate some more of those memories. Terrific. Great. Thank you. So you talked about leaving um, UWM, spending time at Theater X, but you then went on um, Wooster Group in New York, and you spent a lot of time over those years on the stage, and, and then you made the transition to film. And um, so I'm curious about how you see those two genres, and how did your work in theater help with your, your work in film or back and forth? What, what are your views on those two different art forms? They're very different art forms, but uh, working in the experimental theater, which uh, Theater X was to some degree, and the Worcester Group was deeply to a degree, um, it was good training for filmmaking um, because it really taught me how to pretend. It taught me how to commit to an action. It also taught me uh, to view projects and performance holistically in the respect that uh, the technicians were as important as the actors, and the actors had to keep in mind the technicians, and the technicians had to keep in mind the actors. And sometimes in the Wooster group, where we integrated a lot of technology, simple technology, but technology deeply into our shows, that's kind of what one of the things we became known for, um, it created a kind of flexibility and uh, not to be afraid of technology, to embrace it, um, to uh, use it in a hot way, not a cold way, um, not to distance yourself from things, but to use it as a tool. So I, I think that created my love to dance with the camera, uh, to know where the camera is, to enjoy uh, the work of the technicians and work with them to help their, make work, uh, their work uh, go well, because I know then that would make my work go well, because if it's in, not in the frame, it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so actors, actors have to be collaborators, I think, deeply. And actors also have to have respect for all the things that mediate their performance. And not necessarily anticipate, but you have to, it's not about you. You're one part of this very um, complex uh, system of people's one job relying on another. And I think I learned that in the theater, because in the theater, uh, in, in the rehearsal process, you're, you're involved from point zero with the technicians. Great. So I'm going to ask a couple more questions, and then we're going to go to the students. So um, just, just as a heads up in terms of uh, be ready to, to uh, show your hands. Well, um, the first film I saw of you, or you were in, was probably in 1985, maybe 86. Uh, That's late. Where were you before that? <laughs> I was a grad I'm student. It's not I, so late. I, I, was, I was a grad student, so my head was um, you sometimes were busy. awake, you were sometimes busy. like you, sometimes on the cot. Sometimes, uh, oh, you know, awake and trying to stay awake. But my wife, my wife Sarah Swanson, and I uh, saw To Live and Die in L.A. Uh, in, the, in the campus theater. And then shortly after that, uh, Platoon. Uh, and then since then, of course, everything from, from some of the more indie arts types of things, you know, the Florida Project, and then earlier on, um, the, the Life Aquatic of Steve Zissou. Uh, more recently, last night, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty, really late on this one, 20 years late, uh, seeing... seeing um, Spider-Man and, and, of course, the Green Goblin. <laughs> I know everybody's, like, really late. Um, but, but truly more recently, a couple of weeks ago, Nightmare Alley, if you haven't seen that, it's terrific, great. But <laughs> so, so these, these roles, if we think about The Last Temptation of Christ, we think about a number of different roles. You play in The Lighthouse. I mean, we can just keep, keep thinking about completely different roles. Um, tell me a little bit about really two things. One, how do you pick these, these roles? What, what has to work for you to, to, for you to say yes? I'll stop there. Why don't, why don't we just go yeah, with that? Yeah, okay, okay. Um, you know, that's a difficult part, choosing what, what you're going to set out to do. But I've, I find that 
you know, I read a script, I ask myself, do I want to do these things? Uh, is this interesting to me? Is this going to uh, teach me something? Am I going to learn? Is this uh, so different from me that it's interesting? Is this something that I know so well that it's interesting to go deeper into it? That's one thing. But movies aren't just about screenplays. They're about people. And most important is the director to me. So a director that I can trust, I can give myself to more fully. And I'm less self-conscious, and I can be a little looser with. I can be a little freer with. So the director is very important. Okay. And I find pretty much that if I know why I do a project and the reasons are good, whatever happened to the project, I can accept. And that's important because if you take the pressure off, of course I want the movie to go well. Of course I want it to be a success. Of course I want people to like it. But at a certain point while you're making it, you have to not worry about the result. And you have to also not plan a performance too much. You can prepare, but I think the most important thing and when I speak, I'm speaking about my experience. This isn't for all actors. But be present for the scene. Be present to receive what's there. Be present. Be ready. Be prepared. But be ready to throw everything away and, and be present for what's in the room, what's happening. That I trust. So I look for opportunities where I can have that kind of situation. Terrific. And you sure immerse yourself in whatever role. It's, it's just amazing to watch you, um, both, both on film, but also here with us today, live. It's, it's, it's great. Um, so this may be a hard question to, to answer. You know, I think that, that I'll give it a lousy answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, in some places we see Willem Dafoe has made 100 films, over 100 films. I actually think there's, it's, it's closer to 130, 140. I mean, it's, it's significant, it's large. So looking back across that body of work, when did you know you had made it? When, when did you know that this was, this was you know, the big break, that, that, that you're, you're it? Okay, I reject the idea of making it. Ah, okay, <laughs> humility, humility. Uh, no, I, listen, I don't say that with false modesty. I mean. You can't think about that stuff because once you became, become known for something and you get positive attention for it, you tend to repeat that. So you want to dismantle that. You can't absolutely, but you, you really have to keep on going back to the beginning and every project you have, to ha you have and luckily I have a defect or a, uh, or a gift that every time I start a project, I really, I can honestly say, think, how the hell do I do this? <laughs> and I welcome that. I welcome that because you always have to start over again. And once you start thinking that you have to uphold something or you have to be a certain way, that's when you die. And that's where the corruption comes in, I think. Some actors are very good at it. Some actors like to create a persona and then they use that persona in stories mm. to, and, and, and to great effect. And some of great, um, particularly the classic Hollywood cinema, is famous for that, you know? Not about, it's not about transformation, it's not even about being present, it's about being a full-bodied, uh, a full-bodied, personality that walks through these stories, mm. you know? Mm. But I'm not so interested in that. I'm interested in transformation. I'm interested in adventure. I'm in, interested in learning things because for me, if I don't do that, I'll get stuck. And then I'll get bored or I'll feel, or I'll, I won't enjoy it, you know? And even though there are many pleasures and you get pampered a lot, in the end, sometimes I think when I'm, when I'm heading to, uh, you know, a set at four o'clock in the morning and everybody's asleep and it's cold and you get out of the trailer and you put on clothes that are cold 
and then you go and make up, and it's, it's all very uncomfortable. It's not always a glamorous <laughs> life. So you better be into uh, something new happening all the time. Terrific. A lot of reinvention, but you seek it out. Ah, yeah, yeah, great. Do we have a question? Oh, look at that. <laughs> OK, so we've got some folks handing mics out. Uh, let's see where the mics are. Uh, right over here. OK. And we'll get around, so, so just. Uh, um, hi, right. Mr. Defoe. Hi, hi how are uh, you? My name's Anastasia Esther. I'm a senior filmmaker hoping to be a film director one day. Um, my question for you is, um, oh my gosh, you're really here, sorry. Um, <laughs> my question for you uh, from the perspective of an actor is what attributes do you find the best directors have to enable you to give your best performance? Okay. For me, a director creates the world, and he sets the tone, he or she, sets the tone of the proposal for what you're making. That's, that's what it's about. When the world is complete, when you're given the tools, they give it to you, you have a beautiful costume, you have beautiful text, the action is clear, the sets are beautiful, You've, you're in this world, there's a logic to it. You, you don't even feel like you have to invent things or make choices. It becomes very, very clear. So a great director creates that world in a personal, detailed, not cynical way. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> OK, next question. OK, right over here. Hi, uh, my name is Diego. I'm an engineering student, so I feel a little out of place. But um, <laughs> um, kind of going back to Chancellor Monet's earlier question, what do you look for when you're watching a film, kind of going through a director's uh, past filmography? What do you look for in that that tells you this is a director that I could give myself to? Yeah, um, these aren't bad questions. Um, <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> uh, when I say, first, do I like the film? Uh, second, you know, do they have something? Do they have a unique vision? I think I'm less interested in dazzling stylists and more interested in auteurs. Not always, but for the most part. Because I want to know those people. I want to learn from those people. I want to be in the room with those people that turn me on and bring out something in me that I didn't know I had. I, so I respond to a director's need, and I uh, respond to a director's personal desire to make something. OK, great. One more question, then I'll ask a question. Please, where's our next one? Why is everybody laughing? Are you a goofball? Uh, I don't know these guys. Are you a know. notorious goofball? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, so can you speak a little bit to uh, what draws you to projects with like heightened language, like The Lighthouse or Shakespeare, and how is that, uh, how is your uh, approach to that different versus something like Spider-Man or The Florida Project? Uh, um, Lighthouse has heightened language. It's a poetic language. It's a language that, uh, you know, has a literary quality to it. It's also a period film. But I wouldn't say, in a funny way, that the language in Spider-Man is not heightened as well. <laughs> They're both heightened languages. The truth is, if uh, it's, it's not a rule of mine, and I, I don't have, I try not to have rules or hard likes and dislikes. I try to stay open to things. But I, I generally like things that uh, aren't, don't lean too heavily on natural behavior, because I think cinema is better than that. Um, you know, I like poetry in cinema. Uh, Many people talk about cinema in terms of story, narrative, and I get it. A great story is great. But I think there's a tendency, sometimes uh, stories hide the truth. 
And because we identify with the story, we hop on board, we get on that train, and we're along for the ride. And it's pleasurable, it's emotional, you may recognize certain things, you may even be surprised, but you're, you're on that train. With a more poetic cinema, it makes you think. The irony is poetry is less about emotion and more about reflection and exploring things that you don't know, that you can't explain, but then when you connect with it, it's a revelation to you. I think uh, this is going to be a, a bastard version of, of the quote, but, you know, uh, T.S. Eliot talked about, you know, poetry is not a letting of emotion, it's an escape from emotion. I think he was referring to his, what do you call it, uh, what's it called, objective correlative? I you don't know. know. But I... anyway. <laughs> Where's a professor? <laughs> no. I guess I'm riffing on this. I'm riffing on this a little bit. But you get it. Um, so the height language is attractive because it's another tool to explore a different way that's, that's better than life, that, that can um, make us imagine, dream, and wonder better than life. Listen, there's some, th the Florida Project was a lot of that, some is written, some is improvised. It was a beautiful film to work on. I wouldn't call that heightened language. We were leaning on realism there. So it's not like I'm against that, and I, I, I like that movie very much. But before you make a movie, when you have a, a text that is, has a complexity and a poetry to it, I, I, I respond to that because it takes you away from behavior. Because when you have a realistic, uh, when you have a naturalistic text, people can really invest themselves in being like life, being natural, you know? Learning tricks of uh, sitting, walking, looking, that, that cover up engagement with what they're saying. Great, terrific. Are we enjoying this? Yeah. All right, <laughs> terrific. So the next question is going to come from here. We've been uh, pulling from the side. I don't know sides. about you, but I'm going to have a drink. So, <laughs> so uh, we're going to pull here. But before we do that, I'm going to interject a question because um, we're down into some, some pretty important issues. But I want, to, I want to come back and ask something that I, I think about from your social conscience and, and something that I know you've done some projects I've been very impressed with uh, when you've, you've engaged in some world cafe areas, talking about some issues around, um, you know, really pretty, pretty important issues around world peace and addressing hunger and pretty, pretty large things. But let's go down a little bit and talk about the arts in education. We know today, um, particularly in America, um, education oftentimes gets short shrift budgetarily, whether it's a state budget or federally, you know, we're talking about student loan issues right now. It's a really important issue for election uh, times and so forth. But, but, but it's real easy, not just in terms of, of finding it challenging to support education at the level it needs to be, but particularly arts in education. We see this in K-12, we see this in, in colleges and, and other places where it's just really difficult. What's your view on the role and the importance of arts in society and why we should fund theater, film, music, many other areas of production, design, um, okay, to a greater degree? Okay, there's lots of questions there. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> No, we have, we have time. We've got a half hour. Just, they're just kidding. All, they're all important questions, but let me try to back in, uh, do the last part first. Why arts? Because they humanize us. They uh, remind us of our connection to each other. <laughs> they connect us. They, they also allow us to think of how the world can be better. Or they can hold up uh, they can show us where the world is going wrong. So I think it can engage us. I think every film, you know, even if it's a, a, a stupid uh, teen comedy, is a political film. Because when we watch films, we learn how to live from them. It sounds crazy, but it's really true. We learn identity, we learn sexuality, we learn politics, we learn uh, emotion, we learn relationship, we learn all kinds of things from these uh, 
things that are played out before us. And particularly when we used to come together in one room and watch it together, it was even more powerful. Right. Which is why we got to get back to the theater somehow. Yeah. Because. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to sound like an old crank that's sentimental about the old times, but you know that's so important. And maybe uh, movie theaters will become. You know, it'll become a special thing, like operas or something now. But it's so important be, to be in a dark room with a bunch of people watching the same thing and experiencing it. I think then you have discourse. Then you you the connection is made, where with all the watching on platforms, you don't get your feet held to the fire. Not only do you not have the same uh, attention watching, but you don't have um, the people around you. Uh, and everybody's going to the, their places of comfort. They're going to their places of interest. And there's no, there's no push. There's no, there's no coming up against each other. And I think we miss that. So generally, I think the arts make us do that. They, they force us to reconsider our lives. Love it, love it. Very, very important and wonderful perspective, thank you. How about up the middle here, um, from this side? If we bring a mic over to somebody in the middle. Hi, Mr. Defoe, my name is Ash Friedenberg. I am a... <laughs> you got a fan club here. <laughs> I'm a junior musical theater major, um, and something that's really brought on to us here at Peck School of the Arts is the creative process and finding our own creative process. Um, so I was wondering what you think is the most important part in your creative process. Uh, in, in mine personally? <laughs> no, I think everybody's different. So how you, how you approach things, yeah. Each project has a different preparation. But I think one thing that's always true is you should have some tricks up your sleeve. You should arrive with something just to get moving, just to get moving. And then once you get there and you get engaged, you can change everything. But don't wait. Don't wait for inspiration. You got to get moving. Once you get moving, then through a series of actions and reactions, the inspiration will come. But don't wait. So fall on your face, get out there, do it. One of the beautiful things with the Wooster Group is uh, this theater company I worked with, we were not doing traditional plays, and sometimes we were rehearsing in the afternoon, and then that evening we would perform as far as we got that night. It was an experimental theater in a small, converted factory space in Soho in New York. And so we would be performing always, we would be rehearsing always as if it were a performance. Because that night, in fact, it, it, there was no waiting. There was no waiting for things to gel. There was no practice. The practice was doing. And I guess that's it. Don't wait. Don't wait. Do it. Fall on your face. and and. When you get up, you'll know which direction the door is. <laughs> <laughs> which, Love it. Which, Love it. Love it. Great. Which reminds me of a story that I've told before, but I like it so much. And it's not even my story, but a writer told it to me. But it's about making mistakes to help you get to the next step. A writer, and I wish I knew it precisely, it was like someone like Dashiell Hammett or someone okay. like that. He said whenever he got stuck writing, Barry Gifford, the writer, told me this story. And I'm doing bad not to remember who the author was, but you get the idea. Yeah. He was like a noir, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. The guy said when he gets stuck in, in writing, he always has a man come to the door with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and then he has to deal with that. And then the story goes forward, and then he goes back and takes the man out. <laughs> so the point is, the point is, don't navel gaze, do, 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 and in the doing, there will be a reaction, and in the reaction, something will be expressed. And, and then you'll know, 
you'll, you'll shape it in a way as best you can, and that will be your work. Love it. Great. Another question. Hi, uh, Mr. DeVoe. My name is Zoe. I'm a film student. Huge fan. Um, are there any particular roles that you have performed over the years that have impacted your personal character and your outlook on life and completely changed everything upon the completion of the film or the theater project? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, everything changes your life. Anytime you learn something, you have a shift of how you think or what you, know, what you think is true or what your dislikes and likes are. But I, I obviously, you know, I don't know how well you know my films, but uh, I don't know some of them. But, <laughs> um, you know, the ones with more uh, content, uh, ones that come to mind right away are Last Temptation of Christ. Certainly, one that was huge for me was this movie uh, At Eternity's Gate. Uh, thank you. Where I played Vincent van Gogh because I was afforded a deep dive into his letters, mm. uh, his painting, the places he was, uh, biographies about him. He wrote beautiful things in these letters. If you're ever bored and you need something to do, read his letters to Teo, particularly if you're an artist or, or if you're interested in film or theater. Read them. They're really profound. And they, and they have a lot to do also with the relationship of work to spirituality. So those things, once you engage them, you don't forget them. And, and in, in inhabiting those characters, they become part of your story. And for example, with Van Gogh, I learned how to paint. And now there are certain things where I, I don't look at things the same way. I don't look at that stained glass window and say, that's a stained glass window. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> I look at it and I say, I start to see blue, I start to see red, I see four, five, six, okay, that's balancing. You know, it, it engages you in a different way. So those are two examples. But there's, but there's many more, and, and it's a double thing because when you make a movie, uh, there's the life experience, of making the movie, it can even not be a movie that works out so well, or it can be a, a movie that you're given the tools to articulate something that makes something clear to you that you could not have done without the structure of that movie, without that character, without that director, without those other actors. It helps to articulate things. Wonderful. I'm gonna throw a question in that's a little different. You've made films now for five decades, six? Close, yeah, uh, five. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got a birthday coming I up. Make, I did make some home movies when I was a kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not going there. Um, but X-rated. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so... I'm a so, little red um, now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm red too. So what's, what's interesting is um, I was going to ask what's on your bucket list, but you might have already answered that. Um, so no, seriously. We don't have no bucket list. <laughs> okay, okay, seriously, you've just got so many things, so many projects, and life is, is full already with, with what you're doing. So, um, You know, it's about refining things. It's about, you know, everything's changing. I change. I'm older now, um, you know, you deal with that. You deal with your body changing, you deal with how you think changing, you deal with people dying around you that you knew. Um, it's, it's all, uh, the target keeps on moving. And uh, so somewhere I feel like I, I, I'll stick to my guns. I like working, it gives me a lot of pleasure. It's a place that I can have a super awareness. It's a form that allows me to think sometimes better than I can even think in life in a sustained way. So um, I look forward always to being on a set and then you just look for good situations, people that inspire you, and I want to do more of it. 
And it's not to reach a certain goal, it's to refine my understanding of what this whole thing is about, you know, and where we're going, where I'm going, and what may or may not be after. So it's, it's a constant thing. Once you embrace that, that becomes your, not obligation, but that becomes your mode to live. It becomes your way to try to be a better person and try to be useful. And that sounds a little highbrow, because I do make some stupid movies sometimes. <laughs> but that's part of it, too. Yeah. Because yeah. if, you, if you're always strained to, you know, you've got to keep a little bit of a range, and you've got to not get stuck, because if you don't, then you get a little tight, and, and your, your vision of how things are or how things could be starts to get very narrow. Great. Great philosophy. And um, I'm going to add another question that kind of piggybacks on that, and then we'll go back to you for more questions. Today, you live in Rome. I think you spend time in New York. I don't know if you're in Hollywood also in terms of somewhere in California, but you've chosen a path that's not the same. You've become one of the top 25 New York Times and others, top 25 actors of our generation. You've created a body of work that's enriched all of us quite short, um, quite shortly. It's, it's, it's amazing what you've done. Tell us about why you've chosen to live where you live, how you, how you, um, you know, are away from some of the things that other actors that seem to be you know, always in Hollywood or, or things like that, life choices like that. You know, I feel like, <clears throat> of course I make choices, but not consciously. I, I shift from situation to situation, groups of people, groups of people, loves to loves, whatever. I'm in Rome because I fell in love with an Italian woman and married her. <laughs> Okay. That's one thing. <laughs> That's part of it. Um, I live mostly where I work. I'm on the road a yeah. lot. I was in New York for many years, and that also was in love, because then I was in love with the director of the Wooster Group, <laughs> and that's where my theater was. Um, I'm in L.A. some, but not that much because I don't shoot that much there. Um, just for whatever reason, I think because I don't do a lot of family dramas and I don't really do TV, um, I'm not there much. Okay. Um, so it's not a plan. It's not a plan. Also, with the Wooster Group, I, we, our bread and butter was international touring. Mm. We were pretty much for many years reviled in New York. Mm so much so that the director made the wise decision to bar critics from coming to our performances <laughs> because they'd write us about us so badly it did more damage than good. Well, then we started performing internationally, got a very good reputation, and then they wanted to write about us. Mm. And then they started writing nice things. Mm. Um, but my point being, that was a sidebar uh, a digression, but we toured a lot, and I like um, living different places. Um, while I'm very much, you know, still uh, that kid from Wisconsin, um, I do uh, enjoy living in different cultures. So that's, that's what has me uh, moving around. I mean, there was a period where I spent a lot of time in Asia, and that had a profound effect on me. Hmm. Hmm. So when you tell people you're from Wisconsin, um, when they say, where are you from, born, what, all of that, what's, what's the reaction? They say, I thought you were English. <laughs> <laughs> I think SNL put a change in that. We now know the story, if you've seen the um, SNL. They're kind of surprised. Also, also, to be fair, I lived in New York for so many years, and even though I'm not a typical New York type, um, uh, I think they, f because of the Worcester Group Association, yeah. and I was there for many years, and the Worcester Group became fairly well known, and I've been in some kind of New York-based movies, I think they assumed that I was a New York actor. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, born and bred in New York. Plus, live in New York long enough, and you'll start to talk like them a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Questions from the audience? We're just getting warmed up, aren't we? Hi, my name is Ella. I'm a film student. Um, 
I just have a question about a specific director. I just want to know, what was your experience working with the director, Wes Anderson? Oh. Wes is great. I've worked with him several times, in minor ways, in medium ways, and in bigger ways. Um, every time I've worked with him, he has a very precise vision. And his precision is incredible. And he, talk about creating worlds, his world is undeniably a Wes Anderson world. There's much to recommend. He gives you beautiful things to do. His sets are fun. He shoots in fun places. Lots of pleasure there. Um, but I will say that every time I've worked with him, the experience is, is as precise as he is and as such a hard stamp he has on the way he works, each experience I've had with him has been quite different, colored by the location and colored by the role, primarily. But I enjoy him so much. You know, he, he made a, he's so well prepared and sees things so clearly. I remember he showed me a, a stick figure animatronic that he drew and voiced himself of Grand Budapest Hotel. He shot the whole thing, the animatronic, you know what I mean, sketches and animated uh, uh, storyboard, basically. He did all the voices, did all the drawings, very crude drawings. I watched this, and I said, this is fantastic. <laughs> Pocket the money, release this. <laughs> Tell everybody to go home. <laughs> I spat there. Um, uh, the guy is very precise, and that is fantastic. But also, he's smart enough that when he gets there, he makes adjustments. Also, he, picks his he picked his actors very carefully and gives them things that he wants to see them do, and he has an instinct that he knows they will love to do. I've, I've seen very few people, except for sometimes him doing excessive takes, because he's very precise, and sometimes the camera movements are very complicated, so you have to do many takes. Outside of that, I've yet to see an actor on a um, Wes Anderson film that wasn't happier than a pig in. Got it. Got it. We're from Wisconsin. We know these things. Yes. Yes. Okay. Another question. Maybe further from the back. We've not done much from the back. Hi there. Hey. Uh, hi, I'm William. Not Willem, but you're Willem. Yeah. Uh, How you doing, William? <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. And uh, my question is, what is your favorite thing about playing a bad guy in a movie? Uh, you know, it changes. Um, when I was young, I don't think I had a lot of choice. Uh, all the good roles when you're young, if they aren't the, you know, <laughs> the classically good-looking uh, romantic lead, all the good roles are villains. To tell you the truth, hmm. for the most part. Hmm. So that was my way, and then I got some positive reinforcement for that, and then I started worrying about, oh, I'm going to get boxed in. So I tried to mix it up a little bit, and now um, I don't, I don't make the between villains and good guys. Of course, you're aware of how they may have to function in the movie, but whether you're playing a good guy or a bad guy, it's conventional wisdom that you want to give them some sort of dimension. So if you're playing a bad guy, you want to develop the good part of it. If you're playing a good guy, you want to develop the bad part of it, because there is no good or bad. <laughs> Terrific. Um, hi, um, uh, Mr. Default, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Rocky Kari, and I'm a film student at UWM. I'm graduating tomorrow, and uh, it's really scary seeing the future ahead of me and where I could go. Uh, I wanted to ask you, when you were up and up, up and coming artist, uh, what was it that gave you motivation to keep going, regardless of any failures or obstacles that came your way? Um, possibility. <laughs> Love, I mean, uh, you know, I always found ways to do things that I like to do. Maybe not at the level that I wanted to, but I always, you know, if 
people sometimes ask, well, what, what advice do you give to people? And I say, I'm in no position to give advice. <laughs> not because I'm an idiot or anything like that, or not because I haven't accomplished some things, but more because everybody's different. But the one thing that I think is really true, regardless of your character, is you got to get near the things you love. And don't judge what you're doing or how you're doing. Get near it. See how you feel about it. So um, I always tried to engage on that level and didn't get too far down the line saying, oh, am I going to be able to make a living? Am I going to be famous? Am I going to be good? Am I going to be able to good, work with good people? Oh, for that guy, oh, he, he has this, I want that, you know, none of that. It's about, hey, I like what that person's doing. I, I'm going to try to insinuate myself into that theater or insinuate myself into that movie set, even if it's, this sounds crazy, but even if it's getting coffee, because you'll see, you'll be there, you'll really have an experience. And I think I believe deeply uh, 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 a tradition that's lost now, and that is uh, the tradition of apprenticeship. Not that everything's craft, but if you have relationships to something that builds your focus on what you really love to do and what you're interested in doing. And if you can find a way to do that, that's great. Terrific, terrific. Next question. Hello, my name is Rosendo. I'm a journalism student here at UWM. Um, since you've worked on the Spider-Man movies uh, and you've talked about how uh, like working with the other people in production and stuff like that is a tool and using the technology, how has working from like the first Spider-Man using more like practical effects to like the new Spider-Man where a lot of it is just like CGI and blue screen and stuff like that, how has that changed the way you act and like the way you go about making movies? Okay, I, I can pretend I could give you an answer I could give, definitely give you an answer. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that different for me. Because the truth is, yes, it was more sophisticated, but just what I had to do in the second Spider-Man movie, even though uh, the technologies are much more advanced and much more sophisticated, in my particular case, a lot of that fighting was practical. It was on the ground, sometimes on wires, throwing punches, taking punches, falling, this kind of stuff. That's the same kind of stuff I was doing in the original. Um, for my part, there wasn't a lot of CGI. Um, you know, a lot of CGI has, is in some of the bigger shots or how they piece together, uh, like that fight at the end on the Statue of Liberty. Of course, that's a set, and then they cut it into something else. I mean, that, that's where the sophisticated um, stuff comes. But as far as stunt work, it was pretty meat and potatoes. <laughs> no, we were punching and pushing and, yeah, sometimes wires and sometimes stuntmen, you know, uh, covering for us, uh, you know, for the really dramatic, dangerous stuff. But most of it is really quite simple. But even if that was true, I have no problem, you know, it's all about doing tasks for me. It's all about accomplishing things. It's all about going towards something. And then as you go towards it, something happens to you. You know, when you talk about just doing tasks, people are like, well, that sounds kind of dry. That's not very emotional. But when you think about a guy or a girl running a 100-meter race, very simple task, to get here to here as fast as they can. You watch that. Is that unemotional? I don't think so. A lot is going on. I believe in the wisdom of the body. I believe in the engagement of what happens when you aren't quite in control and you're in movement. So that, you know, that's, that's what that was about. So whether it's me running towards that camera when he's supposed to be a man, or whether I'm running toward that guy and he's a man 
and tackling it is basically the same action. It's just a little uh, switch in my head. Yeah. So you've said, you've said a couple of times in different answers, looking forward, looking forward. I'm curious, right now, we talked before this. You don't want to look back, do we? <laughs> <laughs> True, good point. But uh, tell me, what's in your future in terms of films? And, and you know, right now it's a little bit of a quiet time, it sounded like, uh, but you've got several in the queue. I do. Um, I've got like four or five films uh, to come out, and um, I'll start working again soon. I haven't been working for a couple of months, a um, couple of three months. Um, you know, things ebb and flow. I, don't, I never try to work just to work. Um, sometimes things, there's a lot of good projects. Sometimes there's less good projects. Um, also, you balance that about all kinds of things in your personal life and all that. Uh, future looks good. Uh, you know, pandemic, you know, it's tough with movie theaters because a certain kind of movie theater is going to go, uh, movie is going to go on platforms. And movies that are challenging don't do so well on platforms because people, uh, uh, you know, you, some movies you need patience with. And there are great rewards if you can stick with them. And you probably would if you're in a movie theater. But if you're at home and you're eating and you're answering phone calls and things like that, you don't have the same kind of contact. You don't have the same kind of concentration, which is really terrible because some of those more challenging movies are, it's the laboratory and the food for the future of cinema. Because in the most commercial movie you can imagine, all of them have, have to pay some kind of thanks to, you know, uh, Stan Brackage <laughs> or David Lynch or something. You know, it all works into, um, into the cinema art. So who knows where movies are going to go? And to tell you the truth, I don't think about it too much because I get my hands full just, like I said, you know, walking from here to there and trying to inhabit these characters. Um, and I'll still do that until I get myself in a corner and there aren't things I'm interested in doing. And then I can philosophize about the future of movies. <laughs> Love it. Love it. How about one last question from the audience? Who's the lucky person going to be? Hello, Mr. Defoe. My name is Grace. I'm a theater student here at Peck. So my question for you has to do with The Lighthouse. Yes. Um, one of my favorite scenes is between you and Robert Pattinson, where the only line you were given was what? Yes. <laughs> and as an actor, I'm wondering what your approach was to that, how much direction you were given from the director, and how much of that was you and Robert Pattinson just <laughs> creating that scene completely from the ground up with this one word you were given in the script? It's all of us. Um, did he tell us what to do? No. Did we know that there was going to be this back and forth uh, improvisation? Not a big deal. We say what to each other. He didn't say what we need to do with that or anything. We just did it. But we kind of knew because by then our characters were established and we just played with it. But Robert Eggers is a good example of, I think he's a great, great talent. Um, I don't know whether you saw The Northman or The Witch. And, and I, I worked with him a couple of times and I will work with him again because he's a great talent because he has that precision. He does make that world. And he's not a guy that gives you a lot, uh, at least me, gives a lot of psychological or, or um, specific directions. It's all very practical. Um, so in that particular scene, yeah, it was, uh, it was on the page. We got the good setup. How can you go wrong? What? <laughs> what? 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 You tell me. What? <laughs> no! <laughs> he deviated from the improvisation. <laughs> no commitment. <laughs> I told you this was going to be fun. 
So let me, I'm going to wrap up. I've got a few uh, closing comments. Before I do that, though, Willem, anything you'd like to share with the audience? Any, any perspectives? And I know you're going to have uh, a couple more opportunities tomorrow. I think tomorrow. I've shared way too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's give credit to our great, great uh, audience here today. No, good good um, question. Yeah. Good You've done great. You've done great. I would like to start my uh, closing comments really quickly with, um, and I've got an hour. Is that okay? All right. All right. Um, we'll wrap up quickly. Uh, quick, first, a shout out. Scott Emmons, uh, our, our uh, Dean Emeritus of the Peck School of the Arts, really started this with the nomination. Um, shout out to Scott Peck. So, Scott Emmons was our dean who really started the nomination process and that put this whole ball in motion. So it's cool. great. And, and what I want to reflect on for just a moment is that um, you may know the story. When Willem was quite young, he was actually already being written up in newspapers and, and reviews in Appleton. He was, he was already, people saw where you were going. And I've done a little research on this. And not that, but I mean, but, but seriously, in terms of a really public acclaim. Um, and then he met somebody from UWM who happened to be working in Appleton, and that person suggested that he come down here and see what was happening um, before it was called the Peck School, but in our theater group. And he was impressed and spent a couple of years here, and I'm so glad that we can credit UW-Milwaukee for some of the formative work and, and really to be able to have you come back to receive an honorary degree to share this time with all of us. It's just, it's just come full circle. Well, I, I so. thank you, and this is, this is fun for me because my time here was good, it wasn't full term, <laughs> which makes it even more generous and more open-minded and more, more creative on your part. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, and I'm happy to come back because I, I, there's something about the feel of Milwaukee, there's something about the feel of this school uh, that I think uh, is special. Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> Dean Hartman, thank you for hosting. Thank you for the introduction. All of you, thank you. Let's call it good. Thank you once again. All right, thank you. <laughs>